If you like synthesizers and the sounds and music they produce, I think you will like, even love some of these videos. Now, I would be very surprised if you hadn't seen any of them, but I would also be surprised if you had seen all of them. So these videos are about, well, synthesizers and electronic music. There are no performances in this list. There are thousands of electronic music performances on YouTube. And if you go digging around YouTube, you will be able to find thousands of other videos. This is just a small selection of videos I came up with, which I hope you will enjoy. They are all on YouTube. The links are all in the description, along with timestamps or chapter markers or whatever YouTubers call them these days. For each video, I will tell you why I picked it and why I think you will like it. Some of these are among my personal favourites and cover subjects which I find really interesting. They are in no particular order, but there is a sort of theme to them which you may discover as we go through the list. So let's get started with the first one. Actually, the first four. These are all from the same channel, and that is the channel of Alex Ball. And this first video is how I discovered his channel. You probably subscribe to him as well. He makes videos about synthesizers, many vintage, although not all. So the first one is Land of the Rising Sound, a Roland retrospective. And in this video, Alex discusses the origins of the Roland Company and the Roland brand and the Roland synthesizers. This is a superb video and could well be put out as a TV documentary. If you like Roland, and who doesn't, this is for you. The second one from Alex is Electromotive, the story of ARP instruments. Like the Roland retrospective, this is another superb video about ARP and the superb instruments they produced. Number three from Alex is Traveller, a Korg retrospective. And yes, you guessed this is about the Korg company. It's a very interesting story if you're not familiar with it and another must-see video, in my opinion. Korg is actually one of my favourite synthesizer manufacturers. And number four from Alex is the history of the Prophet synthesizer. Now, I remember this instrument when it came out, the Prophet 5. It cost the equivalent of a house back then, I think. Or well, something pretty close to it. I certainly couldn't afford it. It was a superb instrument. And I think everyone loves the Prophet and the sequential and Dave Smith, bless him, brand. We couldn't have a list like this without including Moog. And the next video is Daniel Fisher's behind the scenes tour of the Moog factory. Now this is interesting for uh, several reasons. I don't know if you have any idea how big Moog is. I sort of thought it was a bit like a mom and pop store, perhaps a little factory unit with half a dozen or maybe a dozen employees beavering away putting these synths together. It's not. It's quite a big company. They have around 100 employees. Now, I guess that is pretty small compared to some musical instrument manufacturers, but it's still a fair-sized company and much bigger than some boutique synth manufacturers. So it's interesting to see what's inside Moog, to see the different departments and the process they go through to produce the instruments. One thing you will take away from this, there are so many people involved in quality control. Now it can come across as a bit of a Moog promo video. At the end, you will come away with the feeling that if you buy a Moog synth, you are getting the best quality it is possible to get in a synthesizer. And I think that's fine and I think that's great. The other thing which I thought was interesting is that many of the employees, particularly those concerned with the quality control, are women. What's wrong with that, you may say? Well, absolutely nothing. I think it's absolutely fantastic. But synthesizers, for whatever reason, seem to be a bit of a blokey interest. Most YouTube channels about synths and electronic music have a predominantly male subscriber base. I actually don't think I have any female subscribers on my list. If you're female, put that right now. I actually subscribe to about a dozen YouTube channels which have female presenters. So there's absolutely no reason why women should seem to play such a small part in synthesizers and electronic music. And there are some outstanding female composers and electronic musicians. We'll mention a few in a minute. Now, having mentioned the Moog brand, we have to include a video about Bog Moog himself. 
there are a lot of videos on YouTube featuring Bob Mugg. This one I think is one of the most interesting. It includes Bob's thoughts on electricity and electric circuits, a little bit about his philosophy. There's also a clip of him meeting Keith Emerson and Rick Wakeman. Rick Wakeman's very tall, isn't he? And Rick makes a slightly jokey comment, which we would probably regard as non PC to date, but this video was made many, many years ago. Just a little warning in case you are sensitive to these things. Now, there seems to be actually two identical versions of this video on YouTube. I shall link to them both, you never know, in the description. So the next video is a little bit geeky, but we are a bit geeky, aren't we, about synthesizers. It's Moog versus Buchler, and it's about the development of the control voltage system. It's presented by Mark Doughty, who runs the Automatic Gainsay channel. So this is a little bit about synth development and East and West Coast synthesis. Feed your inner geek. The next video is an interview with Suzanne Ciani. It has a bit of a strange title, part one, a quadraphonic masterclass. There doesn't seem to be an actual part two, although several videos later, Loopob does show us this video, which tells us how to set up your system for quadraphonic sound. But it's an interesting interview with Suzanne Ciani for two reasons. First, she does discuss quadraphonic sound. Now, that's not the same as surround sound. It's about having two speakers in front of you and two speakers behind you. This is the sort of thing which works brilliantly in a live situation. And I believe Suzanne has actually refused to perform in venues which did not have a proper quadraphonic setup. I think quadraphonic sound is the ideal home for electronic music. Now, most of us just have stereo speakers, so that's what I use and I try to position sounds in stereo and even pseudo 3D positioning. But let's see what she has to say about it. And the second reason why this is an interesting video is that we actually see Loop Up. You probably subscribe to his channel. He does super synth reviews, but he never shows his face. In this interview, we have a split screen and we get to see him. And it's interesting to put a face to the voice, don't you think? Now we've got a couple of videos about Jean-Michel Jean. There are dozens and dozens of videos of JMJ on YouTube. This, however, is a very early video. You can tell by looking at him. And in it, he shows us the synths he used to produce oxygen. And what a collection he has. It's enough to make any synth enthusiast weak at the knees. But it's interesting to see the synths that these electronic music pioneers use and how they use them. Now, sticking with Jean-Michel Jean, this next video, I think, is a bit of a gem. I just discovered it recently. It's called The Making of Oxygen by Jean-Michel Jean. And I discovered it on a small channel called The NB Adventures of Ruby. Now, I didn't know how Oxygen was actually made and constructed. Ruby has obviously done a lot of research to find out. And as a synth enthusiast, I found this story really interesting. I don't think JMJ had any cameras when he was making it, which is a shame. So a lot of the images are stock JMJ footage, but the story behind it I found fascinating. If you like JMJ and Oxygen, I think you'll like this too. This next video is perhaps just slightly geeky. Ultimate 10 high-end synth comparison. And I like this for two reasons. First, it is a comparison of 10 of what are probably the most unaffordable synthesizers. So that alone is interesting. But I really like the presenter because as well as demonstrating the instruments, we also get his thoughts and opinion. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the reasons I subscribe to YouTube channels, apart from the interesting content, is that I like the presenter. And I particularly like presenters who have an opinion. Many review type channels don't give an opinion really, they just tell you the facts. Which is great and we need the facts, but I also like to know what people think of these instruments. And this guy, he's not over the top with it, but he tells us what he thinks of each of the synths. And if you like, as he goes from synth to synth, you can mentally add up the cost of each and see how much he has spent to put these synths in his studio. In this next video, we dig into the history of electronic music a little bit. It's called Krautrock, The Rebirth of Germany, and it's actually a programme which featured on BBC TV. 
there are many videos on YouTube which were initially broadcast on the BBC. So as it says in the title, this is a little bit about the rebirth of Germany after the Second World War. What is apparent now in the present day, if might may be allowed to make a very small political comment, is that humans do not learn from the past. But this is about how Germany rebuilt itself and how the artists were looking for a different form of expression, different from UK pop and different from the rock and roll of America. And they are sort of gravitated towards electronic music. And if you think about the origins of many of the electronic music pioneers, Jean-Michel Jarre, Kraftwerk, Tangerine Dream, they all came from the continent. So this is a bit of a look into how the search for a new form of expression evolved into electronic music. The next is another film which was also first shown on BBC4, Synth Britannia. Now this is sort of the opposite to the crowd rock video. This is about the UK's pop music scene and how in the 70s bands threw away their guitars and started using synthesizers. Now they did use them for pop music rather than electronic music in the style of JMJ, Vangelis, Tangerine Dream and all those sort of people. So if you're interested in synthesizers and pop music, this is definitely a video for you. You will know most, if not all, of the bands in this video and you can see how they used synthesizers to create their sound and their songs. What was the first piece of electronic music you ever heard? Now, for me, I think it was the Doctor Who theme tune. Now, although Doctor Who was a British invention, I am sure wherever you are in the world, you have heard the Doctor Who theme tune. It was created by the BBC's Radiophonic Workshop, in particular by another female synth pioneer, Delia Derbyshire. And that's what this next video is about, creating the theme Radiophonic Workshop Doctor Who. It is a really catchy tune, and at the time the electronic sound effects and the music created electronic was just, it was literally out of this world. We had not heard anything like this before. It was also a little bit scary. I think it still is, especially when coupled with the title images, which looked a bit like a skeleton or the inside of an alien creature. It is amazing and actually almost unbelievable today to know how this was constructed and put together. And this video includes film of a slightly older Delia Derbyshire than you may have seen in other Radiophonic Workshop of films. There are, incidentally, dozens of videos about the Radiophonic Workshop on YouTube. Following on from that, we really have to mention Delia Derbyshire, and that's what this next documentary is about. As mentioned, she was an absolute pioneer in the field of electronic music. Now, at the time when this music was produced, Doctor Who and other early pieces produced by the Radiophonic Workshop, there were no such thing as synthesizers. They recorded sounds from a whole host of objects, cut them up, change the speed and put them together to create music. This was a technique developed in France and called musique concrète or concrete music as we say in the UK, at least some of us do. So this is a story about Delia and her music and her work at the Radiophonic Workshop. There's also a little bit about her personal story after she left the Radiophonic Workshop. And if you're not familiar with her story, I really think it's worth watching. We now get to talk about one of my favourite science fiction movies of all time, Forbidden Planet. This was remarkable for several reasons. It came out in 1956. It starred Leslie Nielsen. Yes, that Leslie Nielsen as a leading man. It also starred the lovely Anne Francis and Walter Pidgeon, who was a really great character actor. The Forbidden Planet was also famous for giving us Robbie the Robot, who was used in other movies, including, I think, a TV series called Lost in Space. I actually have the DVD of The Forbidden Planet, and I watched it again recently, a few weeks ago. Apart from being, shall we say, a proper science fiction story, not the usual B-movie hokum of giant ants, the music, yes, the music, was created electronically it was the first electronic music score for any movie if you have heard anyone talk about krell music this is where it came from the forbidden planet 
Now, this was 1956, 10 or 12 years before, but Moog really got going, so there were no synthesizers. The sounds were created by a husband and wife team called Louis and B.B. Barron. And this next video, the music and sound effects of the Forbidden Planet, has what I think is a rare clip, a rare interview with B.B. Barron, who explains a little bit about the process they had to go through to produce these effects. So, like Delia Derbyshire and the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, these pieces of music and sound effects were put together through tape manipulation. Now, as you might imagine, this was quite a long and laborious process. And I think BB says in this clip that it took about eight months to produce the soundtrack for the movie. So tape seems to be making a bit of a comeback. I don't know what is not making a bit of a comeback these days. A lot of YouTube channels are using it and mentioning it and talking about it. So if you want to know what's involved in making music with tape and tape loops, this next video is for you. It's Ben Burt's Sound Lab for Forbidden Planet. And in it he uses tape and tape manipulation techniques to produce sounds which are similar to those in the Forbidden Planet. He pulls back the curtain and shows us how the magic was done with tape recorders. So that's it, that's my 17 videos which I think every synth enthusiast and anyone interested in electronic music should watch. I hope you check out a few, I hope you enjoy them. Let me know what you think. Now, this is by no means a definitive collection. That would be impossible. But I'd be interested to know if there are any videos you think I should have included. Let me know in the comments. And if you've enjoyed this video, maybe you would like to consider subscribing to the channel, ringing the bell. Thank you. So you get notified of new videos as soon as I release them. And clicking the big thumb really is a big help as well. And if you have enjoyed this video, I think you might enjoy these videos as well. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I will see you again in the next video.